Thomas, welcome to the show. Hi, Oleg. Thanks for having me. It's really Absolutely. a pleasure. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation with me prior to us hitting the record button, which I'm sure could have gone into the hours if we just let it be. So I just I figured it was worth worth it for us to finally hit the record and and get into it because there were so many insights that were being shared that I think would be of value to so many of our listeners and ultimately ourselves for this space that we're creating. But before we get into that topic of assumptions and expectations, I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself to some of our listeners, and that is by answering the question that we probably get asked far too often in our lives, and that is, who are you? Wow, that's, um, yeah, it's, it's such a powerful question, um, which, which can probably make everybody talk for a long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Who who am I? Well, I, I I'd ask it. I, I I'd answer it very simply uh, by saying like I'm I'm just me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if you if you ask different people along the way that I've had in life, you'll hear different stories of who I am. So I think I'm I'm in a way probably also a product of how people look at me or what they see. Um, some might see well that I'm a family man um, with children and and married others might see that I have been working in crisis zones for for many many years with with uh, emergency response operations in humanitarian settings um, others others again might see uh, just a good friend who has been there uh, for them so I think I'm I'm really a product of of, of different um, different perspectives that people have on me and and they have met me along different paths and different situations in life, so they've also probably seen different things of me. Because mm-hmm. I'm certainly not the same person anymore that I was maybe 20 years ago. I've I've also evolved, um, but some people might have met me 20 years ago, so they would tell you uh, this story about this young boy who wanted to tear down the world and go out and save everybody. And uh, well, now I'm a bit more reflected, and I've also le- learned my lessons and 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 seen my limitations. Mm-hmm. So I I still try to be the one that well what you see is what you get in a way so it depends a bit on what you see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know I think I I'm curious to know I I got a chance to briefly know who you are and and kind of the the complexity and the different things that make up your individual identity but I'd love for you to dive deeper into the concept or what you mentioned as far as who you are and you said me. Help us understand that why you choose to take that particular perspective instead of choosing to label yourself with a set of experiences or different identities that you've gone through throughout your life. Because I, I, I've really done a lot of reflection over this. I've been pushed to the edge in the sense of also looking into the mirror. And mm-hmm. um, I've, I've come to, to see that it's, it's way more complex than than being like, well, originally from, uh, from this place in Europe, uh, growing up in a way fairly safe, even though not, not in super luxurious circumstances. And, you know, it's, it's in a way this was almost to, it, it put me in categories and I struggled mm-hmm. with that. So I, I decided to kind of uh, accept the different, well, label it positive, negative, complex things about me. So I, I really, I, what I want to be is authentic. And that means that sometimes you, you, you get these elements. And if I have a different day, you get that part of my personality. Mm-hmm. So I really, I really reflected a lot. And, and what I, when I said I was pushed to the edge, I was really focused or I was confronted with a situation where I had so many questions and I wanted to kind of really find myself. And, and what I did was actually asking other people to tell me who I am instead of looking into the mirror. Mm. And so I found I, I did that because I didn't get answers from the people that I was asking. And I, um, I really looked into the mirror and I said, well, OK, yeah, you have your answers here. And you think this about, for example, uh, conflict and you think these are your values. And, and um, I've come to accept that that's something that has changed throughout my, my life. Um, and in a way, still history is a part of me as well. So mm-hmm. I, I struggled to put myself in a category and say, like, now I'm this and then I was that because I'm kind of, uh, in a way, uh, a combination. So that's, mm-hmm. um, that's how I would simply sum it up. Mm-hmm. And you know, for me, what stands out as you were sharing that is, I think when we label ourselves as one particular experience, we, we don't allow it to be anything more than that. So when I, as I was sharing with you prior to us hitting the record button is 
one of my most recent realizations was the years that I spent in assuming that the individual is, can only bring value or, or be of service in that one particular profession that's associated with them. So if you're a banker, you manage money. If you're a teacher, you teach students. But I, the, the thing that's the beautiful thing about people is that just because the person is a banker, it doesn't mean that they don't have other skills, other areas of interest, other passions. And when I turned the story around and started to look at each individual as people who know things that I don't know and know people that I don't know and might be willing to do things with that information that I'm not aware of, then it expanded my whole perspective completely. And it gave me to get into the, it gave me a, a permission to go into the space where I can have a, converse, a free flowing conversation through which we can find possibilities to support each other that we didn't even know existed because we didn't set those limitations in our mind that, oh, he's working in this field, therefore he's only good for that. Exactly. You're putting these categories on and this is what we, we got a little bit into our, our pre-conversation already that these categories I found always to be, well, they, 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 of course they're helpful in a way because they connect you to a person because you might see something in the person that, that you can connect to. Mm -hmm. But there also there is a danger in it because you're assuming if you're not very aware of it you're assuming maybe way too many things. So I've um, I've shared with you before that that sometimes I like to do this exercise when I work with with teams in in facilitation for example um, that I'm then I'm not introducing myself I'm just saying my, this is my name and then I ask people what they think about me. This could be certain categories. This could be, yeah, well, how old I am, for example. I've heard everything from, I mean, <laughs> from 25 to 52. I'm not offended. But for me, it's just, it's just interesting what, what people base their, uh, their assessments on. Because that's the, that's the entry point. Because it tells me also something about them. Um, because, well, they, they relate me to somebody. They have an mm -hmm. assumption based, based on maybe their own experience. Maybe their own, I remind them of somebody. So um, I think this is, this is always very interesting because it gives you really a topic to discuss and it gives you also the chance to, to work together with the people on exploring their own uh, black boxes, as we call it, basically memories, assumptions, expectations, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think to that point, we're always mirroring. And then as we're always looking at, as I was sharing with you earlier, in connecting with an individual for the first time or with, with yourself for the first time, there might be elements that you share with someone else that's close to me, my father, my best friend, whoever it may be. And so in that connection, I think I try and relate it to that individual that I know in order to create similarity. And part of that similarity also comes the trust and the, the creation of the space where you and I can share and be vulnerable because I can see that person that's close and that in a way passed the test of the trust and, and vulnerability and empathy and all these different things that I respect about that individual, which gives me the same exact qualities to see within you. But you're right as far as there is that danger within it because I think there has to be a fine line, in my opinion, as far as how much do you look at that person as your best friend or your father or whoever else because you also have your own personality and your own identity. And so if Absolutely. I set that limit for you, I think you can't get through it. This is exactly what, for me, the, what distinguishes an assumption from an expectation. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, you have the assumption about somebody. So you, you, you connect, right? And we're all naturally seeking for connection. That's, um, it's, you've, you've explored this many times also on this podcast, that we're... Mm -hmm people who, who have our stories and we like to connect also through our stories. So I think that's, that's really a, um, a beautiful thing about having also this assumption and having these experiences. The problem is when they, when they become expectations, when you really, as you say, you, you, you attribute also even more characteristics to a, to a person because they remind you of someone and you expect them to behave accordingly. And if they don't and you're not open enough, then your world can get shattered because it's, it doesn't match anymore. And that connection that you first established so wonderfully can easily be broken because mm -hmm. you're not ready to kind of to change your assumptions and you've let them go too far and they turn into expectations. And I've seen this more many, many times actually where, where expectations when they're not met 
they lead to disappointment, frustrations. A lot of negative feelings are usually connected to that. I've hardly ever heard that when an expectation is not met, that it's something super positive. <laughs> uh, so it's it's that that's a bit of danger, right? And when we when we talk about assumptions, um, what is so beautiful now? I have a, my my young daughter. She's she's not even a year old. Her world is now based also on assumptions, but she tests them, right? So she she goes out and says like, well, this is how this functions, um, and she tries it. And it, if it doesn't, she tries something new until she figures out how that functions for her. So she's open to test her own assumptions. And that tells you how she builds her experience. But later on, since we have, when we get older, we have so many, so many experiences and so many things to store in our, in our brains and memories. We're not really testing our assumptions anymore. And the problem is that we start to really act upon them without having tested them. Mm -hmm. That's when it gets a bit tricky. Mm -hmm. And I think we adapt to those behaviors and you, we make them the norm. So we're not questioning whether or not it relates to who you are or what you may feel. And then there's that other battle and that is stepping into action and wanting to change those behaviors that you may not align with. So that's, it's kind of a double-edged sword that I think we're always fighting when it comes to it, because it's one thing to recognize, but it's a whole other ball game to actually upon, act upon that recognition and make the change that's needed. Very much so, and, and often are we not even aware. I, I, I remember this one situation when, uh, when again, it was I was working with a with a management team, and we were uh, we were giving them a task, it's, and and the team didn't manage. And in the reflection afterwards, we were just saying like, well, why why did you not try that? You know, there was two teams that were supposed to um, to both do the same task and uh, we just simply asked them well, why didn't you do, why didn't you work together because they didn't and then actually one of the one of the participants said because it wasn't allowed you said it wasn't allowed and then I'm, I looked at him like did I say that <laughs> and he, you could see in his face that he tried to kind of nail the point when I said it and then he couldn't because I never said that and then he was acting based on his own assumption, but it wasn't only him. It was collectively, it turned a collective assumption that weren't, they weren't allowed to work together. And, and this was just such an eye-opener, not only for him, but also for the whole team. That there's a lot of implicit assumptions that we're working on, acting on, well, relating on, that, uh, that, that we're not even reflecting over and that we're not even aware of. And, mm -hmm. and that has become limiting in many situations that I've been part of. So, mm -hmm. What are the different categories, if you know, of, of assumptions that we make and that are available to us? Well, that is, uh, that is probably a very technical question. I mean, I can only speak from my experience on that one. But, but of course, we, we assume, I mean, process-related assumptions, personal mm -hmm. assumptions. Right, that could simply be like behavior patterns, could be characteristics, it could could be as simple as, as I said before, age, status, every, uh, anything else. But it also goes, of course, a bit deeper in the sense of, well, uh, how does the world work? I mean, currently we're facing a, a difficult situation in many places of the world, and we assume that, well, we're prepared, for example, in in in, in the richer countries of the, of this uh, this planet because we've, yeah. We, that's that's how we do it and we weren't so i think it's um it's really uh, uh there's there's many levels of assumptions that we that we can face and i i think it's way more present in our thinking than we're aware of mm -hmm. it's interesting that you even mentioned that because what it makes me think of is is when you think of assumptions related to a particular thing every single one of them is so different like when you assume an assumption to a particular process or something that you've done before you, it's almost like you have a roadmap or a foundation to go off of versus if you, if you create an assumption compared to the thing that we're experiencing in this world right now, it's very different because you don't have a foundation there. It's a completely unknown area. And so you, you, it's almost like you, you don't even know what to assume in a way because you've never been there before. And this is what fascinates me because I have seen both sides to that, right? I have uh, I've worked in 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 contexts where this this was a given, right? A situation like we're experiencing now in our context that we're living, uh, where this is fairly unusual, mm -hmm. has been in places where I worked before in crisis and humanitarian settings. This was a very common situation, and I happened to be at the the, the onset of the current situation. I actually happened to be in one of these countries that was um, 
that was really affected by, by all the conflict, by, by viruses, by different diseases, by mm -hmm. poverty and hunger. And I talked to the people there and they were a bit surprised that there's so much, uh, well, they called it fuss uh, around this because they're like, well, we have been living with this forever. Mm -hmm. So I think what, what, what we probably didn't ever expect to do, and that's why I think it's, it's still the case um, right now that we're not turning to the ones that might have the experience in it because we're assuming we can handle it ourselves. Well, we will eventually do that, but, but it might have, there might have been other options to do that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not qualifying here what's a good and bad option, but I think mm -hmm. the assumption that we're, we're able to handle this uh, was, as you say, based not really on experience, but it was simply based on something maybe that, well, that's of course how it's supposed to. I mean, we're a developed country, so we should be able to handle that. And yeah. I think the other thing that, I'll, I'll speak for myself that oftentimes I used to assume it, a lot of it had to do with status. And as it, and that is, if you're a person that was educated, you would only look up to those who were as educated or more educated than you were. But really in, in a case like yours, I mean, we can look at places in Africa that have experienced similar situations when it comes to Ebola or other forms of viruses and learn from that. But I think maybe, and, and I don't know if we're actively doing it. I know people like Bill Gates are because that's, he understands that wisdom can come from anywhere. It's not only from that one source, but ultimately I think it boils down to being curious enough to understand that every circumstance and every situation can give you a lesson or a perspective that you didn't know before. I think this is absolutely crucial what you just said, Oleg, because I think I've, I've experienced this myself many, many times and not only because I've had the privilege to be in these countries, but, but yeah, I, I also, I, I have an education. I, I, I studied conflicts inside out. I thought I knew everything about them. And then I, I uh, worked in a country that was torn by conflict and mm -hmm. me having grown up in a place where I personally, the, the worst conflicts that I experienced was fights with friends or something. <laughs> um, and then I had to kind of give uh, training or basically an, an education on conflict to the people there who'd been living with it. And this was such an eye-opening experience. This was one of my first working experiences ever. And it was such an eye-opening experience because these people had been living with something that I was supposed to teach um, their whole lives. So it felt almost like I felt misplaced. But we, we, again, I took it as a perspective because what I did is like, okay, I'm coming with the theoretical framework here. Now let's test it if that actually works for your situations. And, and that was, that, that's really what, what brought us together because we both shared perspectives, right? I didn't tell them what conflict is because I couldn't, mm -hmm. at least not from the limited experience that I have, but I could tell them how conflict looks in my country. And I could tell them like what, what books say about how conflicts work and we could relate that to their situation. And they, they got new perspectives and really tried to reflect also their own situations in a, in a different way with different concepts. So that really helped. So what you say is, is, is crucial. I think this is also how, how we work in, uh, in my team. Uh, perspectives are the key. And it's about exchanging them because that just will give you new ideas. It will give you new ways of thinking. It will also make you reflect of your own uh, perspectives and and that of course should be done in a way where it's shared rather than you have to convince the other person that your perspective is the right one which often happens mm -hmm. and i think one of the keys to successful facilitation which you mentioned is really just being able to create a space create a space for the under, other individuals to be heard and to be seen and to acknowledge that there's value and wisdom within those experiences that the thing that i've learned over time and what kind of shifted my perspective when it comes to facilitations is I used to have this image that, okay, before you go, before you can be on one end of the facilitation and then as the speaker or someone that's presenting that information, I used to think that you have to have these, these skills and this polished story that you're able to inspire them and completely leave them essentially out of their seats. But really what I've learned over time is that it's, it's more about a discussion. It's here's my experience and here's the, different elements of that experience and then posing the question back to you how do you relate that to your experience what has your experience been like and then through that back and forth i think we can create something magical and that is that space between us where we can better understand each other instead of turning to that one person who's on that, that front and center of the stage and thinking of them oh they must have all the answers when really the answers are always within you. It's just that you haven't revealed them because maybe you haven't asked yourself the questions 
about those particular sets of experiences. And I, I think this is what you, I mean, it's like, <laughs> like you're speaking out of my head. Um, I've had the, the, the chance on a different occasion to also talk about, about this experience that I have made, which, which was exactly what you just described. Because mm -hmm. also now, if, if we reflect upon our, our conversation, I think you've asked me two questions. Um, and I'm, I'm really a person that, that thinks you don't have to have, a, you don't have to even ask questions in order to have really an engaging uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and your podcast, I think, is, is a great example for that because everybody who listens hears that you hardly ask questions. It's basically just sharing, sharing perspectives and that just plays back and forth and then you get a new idea and you basically tell your own, tell your own story to that. And for that, you basically build this, this, this common story. And uh, of course, that starts within you because it's mm -hmm. really, it's this, it's this mirror that I was talking talking about earlier, where you, you are sometimes forced to look in a mirror, because we're we're, we're very quick in going out and asking questions. But what it does is also it gives you first first of all, I think questions give you power. I'm one of those who think that questions give you power, and most of, most people are not aware of how much, because because basically, if you ask somebody else a question, the person is in the spotlight, right? So um, you basically, well, you're just sitting here and, and, and waiting for getting an answer, but you're not having really to share yourself automatically. Um, if you don't do that, well, you can still share and it becomes, a con uh, it becomes a conversation. So I think questions are, they're nice and they're good and they're great tools, uh, but it's not always necessary. Sometimes mm -hmm. we're asking too many. And um, if we don't get an answer, as you say, I think we should also turn to ourselves and ask ourselves mm -hmm. because they might be surprised what we, what we find out there. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we give away our power? We, we give away our power mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of... Um, in, in, in terms of whenever we approach a situation that we may not know something, instead of looking within, we look externally. I, this is a question that I've been asking myself a lot. I mean, I can, from my from my own uh, experience, it's a lot, it was a lot connected because this is in a way what I was trained to do since I was very little. It was really this typical statement, like, if you don't understand something, just ask. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the more insecure I got in the situation, the more I asked. And it was always somebody who, t who told me. And also, I mean, of course, the, the, the school system where I grew up was, was a lot also directed on, yes, there, were, there was the hierarchy and they knew. And of course, they were educated and they knew. But, but what it also did, it didn't necessarily encourage me to think first what I think about it. That changed a bit in university, but still, then it was very technical. It was not; it was more subject related, not personality related. And and later on, I I, I had to deal a lot with with indigenous peoples, and there, it's very different because in very many indigenous cultures, it's actually not well. They, they don't want you to ask questions as a young one. It's really about observing. It's about listening. It's about learning. It's it's really about taking small steps, making you finding out who you are yourself and then sharing it with the rest and what it does is it creates this wonderful dialogue because you're not i don't have to convince you about my reality i'm just very happy that i i found out what my reality is and i'm happy to share it with you and as much uh, i would like to hear what your reality is if you want to share so i think it becomes this sharing and becomes mm. a completely different dialogue and this is what what why we also the moment we talk we get immediately into these conversations already before you hit the recording button because it, this is automatically what happens when we talk I find. Mm -hmm. And that's such a beautiful perspective. I I never thought about it until literally now. And that is, I don't have to agree with what your reality may be. Your reality is completely your own reality, and how you perceive it is completely unique to who you are. And that's the, that's the beauty of uh, part of, I guess, maybe even in me asking the question of giving away our power is embracing the uncertainty that you may not know the answer. You may never find the answer to that question. And that's okay. And that's, I think, the beauty of it all is just choosing to embrace the journey for what it is and maybe not for what it has to be, but choosing to embrace it in the moment that, hey, I know this stuff and I'm choosing to act and make decisions based off of it. And whatever that comes from it, as far as additional perspectives, additional ways to look at certain situations or make certain decisions, that's an add-on. Those are the lessons learned. That's the takeaways. And I think there's so much beauty within that. But be before we go into that, I want to actually dive into something that you shared with me during our first call. And it was that conversation, not the conversation, but the experience 
that you had with the indi- indigenous culture. Could you tell us that story of, I, I think it was the course that you took, right? Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a, I can give you the brief, brief cornerstones of it. Uh, you have to just stop me when I talk too much, but um, it was, it was basically a complete coincidence. Uh, I I'm from Austria originally. Right. And I am, I was really in, in a very bad spot uh, in, in my life. I was having not, not really having a purpose, kind of couldn't motivate myself. I was just sitting on the sofa. Um, I'd just come out of a crisis zone where, where, where I had very intense work. I hadn't really worked through this experience yet, but I fell into this complete hole. So in crisis zones, you work very much on a high level adrenaline and you really you have this purpose-driven feeling all the time. And, and, and my assignment ended and then I, I ended up on the sofa. Right. Mm. So I did, I Googled a lot and I, uh, <laughs> I got this, this, uh, this course, um, this was already many years ago, like eight, nine years ago already. I found this course about, um, uh, traditional leadership and media, uh, leadership and mediation training. And it was with an ori- original community in, in Australia on an Island. And I was like, Oh, well, you know, whatever I like, I like mediation. I'm a mediator. So I want to know a little bit about that. And I always liked indigenous cultures. I've worked with them before. So let's just write them. And I think what happened then was um, that they made a mistake because they didn't read my application carefully. Cause when I, when I showed up on that Island a couple of weeks later, um, it turns out there was the only non-Australian and Austria and Australia for a funny reason in English is almost the same word. So they didn't mm. really read my application. They thought I was anyway Australian. So I ended up there on that, that island. And what happened there was they basically, it was, was really uh, a, a bunch of white people uh, that were invited to, to get an insight into the, the traditional ritual um, that was a conflict resolution ritual. And it started all with a little bit of theoretical introduction. And basically there was only one rule. And that one rule was you're not allowed to ask questions. Just mm. observe, listen, learn. And of course, we being all trained, I found mm-hmm. out it's not only me who was trained like that, but also my, my fellow white uh, colleagues from, from Australia, they were the same. They, they came there to find out, to get knowledge, to, to listen to what, what is mediation in Aboriginal context. But every time we asked a question, we were reminded of that. Don't ask questions, observe, listen, learn. And I can tell you it was probably the most frustrating three days I've ever had in my life because you're so hungry. You're, you have this unique experience. You think you, you need to kind of absorb all the knowledge that you can get from them, but they won't answer your question. Hmm. Only, and, and I wasn't the only one who felt that way. So we were all ready to leave after day three and think like, oh, we spent money to come here. And uh, what is this all about? And then like magic overnight, that, that perspective changed because, you know, eventually I needed my answer. And there was only one person who could give it to me. And that was myself. And that's when, com- when things changed completely. And that wasn't only for me, that was for everybody because we, we really, um, we started to reflect over what, what do I think about this? So what do I think about leadership? What is it actually for me? What has it always been like that? Has it changed um, my view on conflict and so on? And as a next step, we, sh- we started sharing. So it became this dialogue as just, just, just what we have here now. So it becomes mm-hmm. a dialogue and that was just this beautiful experience that I just took away from there because, well, it was followed by dance rituals and all, but, but instead of then thinking, Oh, I'm completely embarrassing myself because I have to do a dance that I don't know. We actually adopted the same feeling. So you become, you, you're focusing on yourself. And that's um, that, that was just a beautiful takeaway. Mm-hmm. And probably part of that journey, you've also understood the importance of listening and, yes. and active listening. You, you listen, you really listen that's the thing you become so curious because I found out so much about myself. So I was so curious what you found out mm-hmm. right, about yourself. So I wasn't even interrupt interrupting. I wasn't even questioning. I, I didn't try to convince you, even though, as you say, I had a, maybe a different perspective on it, but it was, it was, I was just more fascinated. Oh, wow. This is what you found out because what, what, what didn't happen was that we, that somebody else gave us one answer. So we had the same answer, but mm-hmm. we interpreted it which is something very different than your reality and my reality. It's an interpretation of somebody else's answer, but now you have an answer and I have an answer. And that's, uh, that's something I thought that was very much really a connector. Mm-hmm. And it was, uh, was an incredible experience because I didn't walk away only with my own perspective. I walked away with many different realities that, that all were like puzzle pieces that contributed also to my own picture. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to know in, in, I don't know if there's a way to even answer that question as far as were you aware enough in the moment to understand it, but 
prior to that experience and that journey that you went on, when you were listening, what did you hear? And then after that journey, when you were listening, what did you hear? This is, this changed significantly. And, and this is an experience that I'm still working on, right? I, I learn from it every day. I try to actually make this philosophy into my work now to really enable others to, to just simply have a space like that, not to have the same experience, but a space where they can try out things like that and, and forced to look at themselves. Um, I heard, of course, before I came there, I heard answers. I was a very factual person. I, I you know, I wanted to have the information and, um, analytical and really like I was I was not necessarily diving into this but but basically I wanted to construct my picture based on what you were saying mm. yeah. after that I was listening very I was listening very different I was I was more listening on what are you telling me about yourself in whatever you tell whatever you share not only the facts because the yeah the facts are the facts but I I, I didn't always listen or find the person behind it Afterwards, they change because I tried to listen for things that, um, that tell me a little bit more about who you are, mm. where you come from, right? What, what is, how do you see things? Because we're very quick and very often repeating stuff that we hear somewhere, but it doesn't necessarily give away who we are. But we still, when we say it in our own words, we always tell a little bit about ourselves. It's almost impossible that we don't. And mm -hmm. this is what I want to, to, to be more sensitive to afterwards, mm -hmm. And that the, there are two things that come to mind as far as speaking it in, in the words or in the nat, in the language that's most natural to us. It happens all the time, especially at moments where, at, where we are at ease. Mm -hmm. So when we get, get away from the judgment or what is this person going to think of me if I shared this or how do I sound like I'm more educated than I may be. And I, I think it, I think a lot of us do that. I mean, let's, let's face it. We're all humans. And so we're depending on the circumstance and the situation we're always in those positions. The other part that, as you were sharing the story, made me realize is the importance of listening, not to respond, but listening to understand and understand the circumstance for a situation that you may not have seen before. Because you, you can have similar conversations, I think, in life, but every single one of them can bring a different perspective because you're at a different chapter or a different phase of your own personal life when that thing occurs. Yes, very much so. I mean, both, both parts, the, the self-awareness is, is something that is, is really that I took away from this experience is I'm me. So even as I said, initially I am me and maybe that's also where it comes from because this is what comes with me. Right. And mm -hmm. the experience that like, yes, I'm, we're all self-aware and we're all of course emphasize different things of, of, of who we are maybe in different situations but it shouldn't be as important what others think of us because they will still see us mm -hmm. so i think that's that's an important thing that i took away because so if i for example recently uh, very spontaneously decided okay i want to go and do some acting again so i i, I did a little audition in the the local hobby uh, acting uh club here completely spontaneously like everybody who knows me was like oh well, really yeah yeah that's been long ago and it turns out to be a musical acting class or musical acting club and i'm really not musical at all and mm -hmm. we had to sing there as well and i'm like well you know what what the heck i just <laughs> and this is really like i didn't care what they thought of me because for me it was about the experience right so so uh, uh that's the one thing and the other thing is really this this whole you can have similar conversations, as you said, yet they're ne for me, they're never the same because you, you have your, your journey, how you got mm -hmm. there. And we talk about topics you might have talked about before and I might have talked about before, but we have not shared our, our stories. And, and even if you hear the same arguments, it's, it's still f interesting to, there's always something to explore. So it's like, how do you get to the dirty argument? And I love, love this one exercise where you basically, you draw uh, uh the way your your life has gone and basically these turning points that affected your values and this is why also for example when when there's discussions around values or or what what things like belonging mean um they might have meant something different when you were 20 years old or 25 mm -hmm. or 30 or even older right when i talk to my parents or grandparents they might see belonging as something completely different but they might have seen it 40 years ago the same way i do now so mm -hmm. um this is just fascinating and there's so much to explore there. I found. Mm -hmm. And it brings up a, a story that a friend of mine had shared with me recently about 
one of her values and how some of her values have changed over time and she was struggling with it and and the reason why is because you know she thought she was this one thing five or six years ago and now it's changing and i said well that's okay it doesn't mean that you've lost it it just means it's taking a different shape so whatever your your understanding of what it was like to be honest or to be courageous or someone who aspires to always learn was five or six years ago it's okay for those things to change and let's face it i i think and the reason why I believe this is because the, the journey of life is literally like that. So the journey of life, I think, is very relevant to the journey of life as it, as it relates to each one of those subjects. So the, the concept of honesty, you're going to have the peaks and you have the, the valleys. And that is you're going to have moments when your honesty is tested. And so I think what I've learned over time is that we make decisions based on what we know at any given moment. And so instead of choosing to blame myself or be embarrassed or guilty, which are all natural feelings and they're okay to experience, but ultimately I think what I've learned is that just embrace it. Yes, you might have been honest 99% of the time or however many. That's to assume that you're even measuring how many times you've been honest and dishonest, which I don't think any of us do. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's in the moments like that where it happens where – Yes, I, I, I believe that I'm an honest person, but maybe there were times when someone else perceived me as dishonest or someone who's not courageous or someone who didn't do this. But the truth of the matter is that we're all like that in any given moment of our lives. Every single one of those values that we have or that we associate ourselves with also has a lifetime of its own. So it's not going to go like this it's going to go the same exact way that your life goes. And that brings us in a way back to the assumptions, what you've just said, because it's, it's, we, we mustn't assume that it's, well, just because we think something now or we did something now, we're always going to do it because that's where, mm -hmm. where, where our choices come in. That's where our, um, where our ability to change, our ability to reflect comes in. So yes, you, you, you can turn into somebody who's, who's dishonest, but that's, Probably if you don't reflect over it or you do it deliberately in mean, either, either of the ways. But if you're reflecting mm -hmm. over it, like, well, I was dishonest now, but what led, what led to it? What, why did I take this, uh, this path instead of the other one? And reflect over it and say like, well, okay, this is the choice that I've made. I won't go back and, and I cannot change it anymore. I've, I've already made it. And I take it with me as, as that, as I want to want to take it with me. And I like this really, this, this thinking of um, we are, part of what our history or journey made us i mean you're a great example your your journey is incredible and 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 you took it with you you still mm -hmm. you still take it with you on a daily basis because you know it's 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 part of your story and it's part of who you are today because if, mm -hmm. if it wasn't for that journey you would have been a you would be a different person today absolutely Not or worse but you would certainly be a different person with different experiences and that would just be as valuable but but that but but all i'm trying to say is basically really that that our past is is there and it will not it, it's past that's mm -hmm. the good thing about it but it's in a way also still there because it makes us who we are and mm -hmm. we can choose what we take from it as well but we are the result of it mm -hmm. and that's i think the beauty of our stories is that they're always attached they're always there it's not it's not so much oh i've worked through my past therefore i don't have it it's that i've shifted my focus and I choose to tell the story of maybe the present or the future version of myself or my experiences. And I think that's the beauty within that is going back to what you said as far as the power of choice and understanding that I do have a choice in what I, and where I put my attention and my intention when it comes to it. And, and just understanding that thing alone allows you to reshape your experience completely. The thing that you mentioned as far as the, you know, the example of being dishonest is that I'm sure we've all experienced feelings of that in, in certain situations of our lives, right? And, and the, the point of the journey is, I think, not to blame yourself for it. And, and I'll summarize that with a quote that I saw recently. I think it was yesterday. And the person had said, remember, good people also make bad decisions. It doesn't make them bad. It makes them human. And it's spot on as far as instead of looking at it, oh, I can't believe I did this. I'm a failure. or I'm the worst person in the world. 
It's I'm human. And this is exactly what I've learned in 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 all these crisis settings. What you just described is is in a way I I. I've learned not to look at decisions as bad decisions or good decisions because in a way, the moment I've taken a decision, it's the decision that I took. So there could have been maybe a better decision, but it's still the best decision because it's the one I've taken. Yeah. What, what the result is and the effect, that's a different story, right? So if, if the result is a bad one or if the effect of the decision is maybe not as good as other decisions would have been, mm-hmm. great, I can learn from it. But if I look at it as, oh, that was really a bad decision, it's almost like a punishment. Yeah, and, and, an additional uh, one on top of the actual circumstances that happened. And it stops you in a way, I've seen that many times, it, it stops you instead of moving on, you, you continue to beat yourself up over the bad decision. Instead of saying, okay, what do I learn from it? What, what, what happens next time? Um, I know there was a better decision now. Next time, what could I do differently in order to maybe reach that better decision immediately? Mm-hmm. But, but going back to this, oh, this was such a bad decision, it, it, it stops you. It stops you from just taking the steps forward. It stops you from taking the next step, moving on, learning from it. Mm-hmm. So that's why, why the negative labeling is, is, is very risky, um, I found. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that I think it stops you from is trying that thing again in just a different form. And, and that's where I think the, the thing that I've learned recently is behavior is so important and and how we view certain changes in our behavior when it comes to decision making or different habits that we're trying to introduce so i've recently shifted my my whole i guess you could say routine from having it be chunked into hours rather than focusing on what are the things that i want to do and what are the things that i enjoy the reason why i did that is because for probably years five to six, maybe even longer years, I've tested with all these different routines and schedules and trying to figure out that ultimate thing that works for me. Well, the reason why I struggle with it is because A, there are so many different ways to do one thing. And the the most recent one that I tested with was time blocking. So Mm -hmm. you get up at five or you get up at four and then you do certain thing for this hour, then you do the next thing for next hour and then you continue on. The reason why it didn't work for me was that because there were days when I wouldn't get up at that time, I would get up two or three hours later. And so I would blame myself for missing that two or three hour window where I could do the things that I wanted to do and genuinely enjoy. And then what clicked for me recently, this was probably two weeks ago, was instead of time blocking, I literally remember sitting there and I said, why don't I just do it? So what that it's 8 a.m.? So what that I'm three hours later than expected? Why don't I just still do the thing? And my life changed. My life changed from that point on when it, came, when it comes to the habits and the behaviors is because I, I finally understood that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a set of behaviors and habits to follow, not a hour-by-hour routine. It's incredibly liberating <laughs> to listen to that because uh, I was I was also a couple of weeks ago I was asked um, how would a perfect day look for you and I gave it a bit of a thought but then my my question was a, uh, my answer was a perfect day for me would be if I didn't look or didn't have to look at the time or the watch at, at any point in the day because what that does what that for me was symbolizing is exactly what you described. It's really, I'm following my, my activities, my, my urges, what I, what I like, my, what I enjoy, what I feel like, um, rather than, okay, mm-hmm. from 10 to 11, this is on the agenda because we've all had this, that we, <laughs> we sit in there. I should be creative from 10 to 11. I'm like, I'm really not creative now. It doesn't, it, there's nothing. Um, and then you try all these techniques and so on, but, all of a sudden in the middle of the night at one, it happened to me that I wake up and I'm like, Oh yeah, this is the idea. This is exactly what I was thinking of or under the shower, or, you know, this, yeah. the, the, diff- the different places. And if you manage to really embrace that, which you've just described this, this technique, I think you, you, first of all, you have a lot more fun. You feel a lot less pressure and you basically get a lot more out of it. 
that's at least how I how I felt it. Doesn't always work, of course, because there's also the the world around that that yeah. works <laughs> in hours and so on. But if you the if you if you have that that room, that's just brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of that journey, I'm sure there'll be layers w- upon layers of understanding and continuing to evolve and adapt. So I don't think I've discovered the ultimate thing, but at the same time, I don't think you ever are meant to discover the ultimate thing. Because if you find the ultimate thing, then what's the point? What's the point of you continuing to live and experience different things? I think each one of them, each one of the phases give you a, gives you a different set of experiences. That's why I think this concept of one of the things that I used to get asked all the time is when are you going to write the book? Write your book. Well, yes, I get it. That there's some sort of um, impact that you can have from writing the physical copy. <clears throat> but within the past few years, I started to look at it from a different lens. And it is, who's to say that I'm not writing my book right now? I'm writing it as we speak because each one of the phases that I can reflect by, back within my life, they're all chapters. I remember the chapter that I experienced when I was 18 years old, which is a very different chapter from the chapter I'm living right now. Yeah. And the lessons that I took away within that are completely different from the ones that I took now. And it's not to say one is better or worse. It just is. Each one has its own unique set of lessons and takeaways to be learned from. But that that's, I think, the, the point that you and I have made numerous times throughout this conversation is the importance of just embracing the journey for what it is and eliminating yourself from assumptions in order to create more possibilities within your life and open yourself up to things that you didn't even know existed within your, your sphere of possibility. Exactly. You just eliminated an assumption by saying like, who is not, who is to say that I'm not writing my book. Mm-hmm. So eliminate your own assumption that you've had maybe for a long time that you're not writing it, but you've already written parts of it just because you may, might not have written it on paper or some, maybe you have written some, doesn't mm-hmm. mean it's not written yet. So mm-hmm. I think that's, um, that's absolutely crucial. And really this, this embracing that, that it is a path. It's a journey. It's moving. It's moving as we speak. Um, but simply this, this hour, however long we have been discussing now has, has just enriched my, my reality so much because you've shared your reality with me and you've given me the chance to, to, to tell a little bit about how I see certain things. And I think that's, that dialogue just has been already a, such a huge contribution to my journey that, uh, that, yeah, it's, it's just great to, to be able to embrace situations like that. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that I appreciate about this particular conversation is that there's so many things that I learned as far as even the simplicity of a dialogue. And that's really choosing to listen for meaning and speak from a place that's deep within you, but also wanting to better understand how it relates or, or, or different things like that. Instead of just choosing to speak to respond, which I think sometimes happens is speaking to respond. Once again, instead of speaking to understand, same thing as speaking is listening to respond and listening to understand because just like speaking is a form of contribution to a conversation. One thing that I think we forget is that listening is also a contribution to a conversation. So it's okay to take a pause. There's no reason to label it. Oh, that's awkward silence. It's just, that's a space, probably one of the more critical spaces, even if you don't think about it, where you can actually reflect and then make a choice as far as what do you do with that information? You know, we're experiencing a, a moment of crisis as a world. Yes, it's one thing to entirely absorb the whole thing. And for me to almost like vomit everything that I've heard back onto you versus I absorb it and then I make a choice. How do I want that information not only to impact me, but to maybe impact you? Yeah. You, you tell me what you, what you make of it. Yeah. And I tell you what I make of it. And, and maybe together we just create this kind of between us, which we, we, the thing we can look at it from, from, from different sides, which doesn't mean you're taking anything away from me and I'm not taking anything away from you. And I think, I think that's the beauty. And silence is for me, one of the, the, the most beautiful tools. Mm-hmm. It's also for many people very difficult to, to, uh, to take silence because we're, we're just not used to it. And it's a bit like, okay, what's coming now? So it creates, it creates insecurity, but it's actually a very powerful, powerful tool because you, you really, if you let it, if you sink into the silence, 
it's so powerful and it's actually empowering. That's what I find. Um, and there's this uh, this uh, this Austrian um, communication psychologist who's who uh, Paul Watzlawick who said once, well, you cannot not communicate. So hmm. I think um, that that is a very valuable statement. And if you think of it, um, silence. One might think it's not communicating, but it is. You always are. You always are. You're always communicating and you're always being perceived, not even by other people, but even by yourself for that form of communication. Wow. Thomas, what's the best way that people can connect with you and find a little bit about more about your work? Because I know that you and I can continue having this conversation for the next five to six hours, but I'm not sure if the the listeners want to uh, take (laughs) embark on that journey with us during this particular time. (laughs) No, people, people can connect uh, with me, of course, on, on LinkedIn, um, but also on our website, Groundwork, www.groundwork.team. Um, and yeah, just uh, connect, drop me a line. I'm, um, I'm always uh, looking forward for meeting new people. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you for sharing your experience, your insights, and you've definitely given me quite a bit to think about and reshape when it comes to my own perspectives, assumptions, and expectations, which I think that the thing that I'm learning is this, and the thing that I've learned through this conversation is that there's no way to eliminate completely the assumption or expectations. It's more so recognition of when it's happening and how how is it impacting my perspective and my conversation and understanding of that individual. Thank you really very much for having me it was a pleasure and thanks for for letting me learn from you i uh well once again an absolute uh, uh absolute brilliant and interesting conversation thanks Ole.